Operation Hickory, the first combat operation for the 3rd Squadron, 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. On 7 October, the squadron deploys near Nam Trak along Highway 15. For two days, while units comb the area, only minor contact is made with the enemy. On the third day, a resupply convoy arrives with food and fuel for the troops. During the break, troop commanders discuss additional search missions. But heavy sniper fire is suddenly encountered from behind the tree line bordering the command post. As armored vehicles converge on the area, the transfer of supplies is halted. For men and vehicles alike, it's a baptism of fire. The heavy firing continues for 15 minutes before the sniper's guns are finally silenced. The resupply operation moves to a new location, but heavy rains have reduced the terrain to a quagmire. Recovery vehicles are brought into play. And this hapless supply truck, like others, must be towed onto firmer ground. Regrouped in its new location, Operation Hickory prepares to resume its search and destroy mission. On 15 October, a C-130 carrying members of the 1st Philippine Civic Action Group sets down at Tainin Airfield 100 kilometers northwest of Saigon. The troops on board are the second contingent to arrive, bringing its total strength in Vietnam to 2,100 men. Activated in July, the group is exclusively concerned with economic and technical assistance to the Vietnamese in areas recovered from VC control. After an inspection by their commanding officer, the men board trucks bound for their company area. The unit's capabilities are primarily in engineering, construction, and medical assistance, but it is fully armed and provides its own security in case of attack. Upon arrival, a briefing is held on the current mission clearing of an old Viet Cong stronghold, the Tan Jien Forest, for agricultural development by refugee families in the area. First order of business for the new men, however, is setting up a defense perimeter and living quarters for themselves. The opening of the rich forest lands, which will help to raise the living standards of thousands of Vietnamese, is typical of the large-scale civic action this unit will undertake throughout Tainin province. The Matsu Island chain is an integral part of the Taiwan Island complex, stronghold of the Republic of China. The Matsu chain and the entire Taiwan complex comprise a heavily armed, fortified landmass, virtually afloat off the coast of communist China, which is visible in the distance. These scenes of the red coastline show communist sampans just offshore. They were photographed at a distance of five miles from Gaodong, nearest of the nine Matsu Islands. On Matsu Island itself, two United States Army advisors and a nationalist officer examine holes created by communist propaganda shells. The round is of Chinese manufacture and probably was fired by a Russian-made 122 millimeter field gun. Only 25 meters from where the shells landed stands the Matsu headquarters of the U.S. Military Assistance Advisory Group. MAG on Matsu is commonly referred to as MUDCAT, a contraction of Matsu Defense Command Advisor Team. Some of the team's functions will be explained by its chief, Lieutenant Colonel Charles I. White. MUDCAT has the mission to observe, assist, and advise Matsu Defense Command on the use and maintenance of all equipment in the military assistance program. 
In addition to monitoring the utilization of equipment, we also frequently check the training of all types of units. As team chief, I also monitor the infantry, artillery, and the air defense artillery units within the Matsu Defense Command. To accomplish this mission, our team consists, in addition to myself, an ordnance advisor, a signal advisor, three communicators, an administrative specialist, and lastly but not leastly, a Navy medic. The Matsu Defense Command Cadre School on Matsu Island is one of Mudcat's advisory responsibilities. This class on the M1 rifle is part of the 12-week course that provides instruction and training in the usual NCO subjects, including weaponry, tactics, and leadership. Bayonet drill and karate help sharpen these embryo nationalist non-coms, many of whom will be assigned to units stationed on the other eight islands in the Matsu complex. The Matsu Defense Command's highly trained, physically toughened troops are part of a well-equipped nationalist armed force that numbers more than 600,000 in the entire Taiwan complex. An ammunition reconditioning center set up deep within a cave for security against communist shelling is another Matsu installation, which receives advice from Mudcat. Maintenance problems on Matsu are compounded by the need to keep ammo in operational readiness at all times, rather than in storage. Civic action is another responsibility of Mudcat. For two years, team members have been conducting a twice-weekly physical training program at the Matsu Junior Middle School, attended by children from all nine islands. While inside the school, other team members conduct English classes five times a week. Okay, we're off to New York. Taxi, taxi. Taxi, taxi. Where to, sir? Where to, sir? It will take 20 minutes. It will take 20 minutes. As soon as possible, please. As soon as possible, please. Please. However, it is with Nationalist Army personnel that U.S. advisors devote their most intensive efforts. These scuba divers, participating in a beach landing exercise, are members of an amphibious reconnaissance company assigned to the Matsu Defense Command. As other members of the company wait offshore, the two scuba divers crawl onto the beach to make a reconnaissance. This exercise is only one example of the exceptionally varied training being given to nationalist soldiers on Matsu. And Mudcat is helping to improve the combat readiness of these already capable troops. At this radio station, Mudcat frequently advises broadcast specialists under contract to the Matsu Defense Command. Here, they beam propaganda to the Chinese mainland. Another form of psychological warfare originating on Matsu is the use of propaganda balloons. Boxes of leaflets are attached to some to be released over the mainland by a timing device. Scarce items such as clothing, ballpoint pens, and toothpaste are also included in the propaganda payloads. Soaring across the Taiwan Straits, they are yet another means of informing people on the mainland that the free world offers a more plentiful way of life. On the afternoon of 17 October, President and Mrs. Johnson arrive at Honolulu International Airport 
on the first leg of the President's Six Nation Peace Mission to the Far East. Amidst the famed hula dancers of Hawaii and bedecked with flower lays, the President and First Lady receive a tumultuous welcome. In a short address to the civilian and military dignitaries and the thousands of Hawaii citizens who have come to the airport to greet him, Mr. Johnson expresses his and Mrs. Johnson's appreciation for Hawaii's warm reception. Then the presidential motorcade heads for the East-West Center on the campus of the University of Hawaii. At the government-sponsored educational center, President Johnson outlines U.S. foreign policy in Asia and his hopes for the future. I go to Asia with confidence and with hope. Behind the terrible cost of combat and hostility, I believe that a new Asia is gradually coming into its own. The process is slow. But the signs are unmistakable. One after another, the nations of Asia are casting off the splint slogans of earlier national, narrow nationalism. One after another, the nations of Asia are grasping the realities of an interdependent Asia. Well, what are these realities? That the security of every nation is threatened by an attack on any nation that national stability and strength can only come through self-help, rigorous planning, hard work, and sacrifice. That political power held by the few and the rich within a nation is power that will not long survive. That lasting national prosperity can only come through full cooperation with one's neighbors the rich and the poor, the large and the small alike, that no single nation can or should be permitted to dominate the Pacific region, that disputes settled by other than peaceful means are disputes that will remain unsettled. Most important of all, that Asia's destiny lies in the hands of Asians themselves. Sooner or later, the pragmatic and the compassionate spirit of the Chinese people will prevail over outmoded dogmatism. And we in America look to that day with hope and with confidence. And for our part, we shall do what we can to hasten its coming. We shall keep alive the hope for a Free flow of ideas and people between mainland China and the United States, as I have said so recently on so many other occasions. For only through such exchange can isolation be ended and can suspicion give way to trust. We do not believe in eternal enmity. All hatred among nations must ultimately end in reconciliation. And we heartfully look to the day when the policies of mainland China will offer and will permit such a reconciliation. But we are not prepared to pay for peace the price of freedom. We shall never surrender American freedom or sacrifice the freedom of America's allies in Asia. Early the following morning, 18 October, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson arrive at Hickam Air Force Base and depart for American Samoa. Several hours later, the presidential jet arrives at the Pongo Pongo Airport in the American territory of Samoa. The President and First Lady are met by Territorial Governor Rex Lee, a presidential appointee, as a school band plays Hail to the Chief. Also on hand to greet the president are 20 Samoan tribal chiefs and royal ladies who present shell ulas to the visitors. 
As the chief executive and the first lady mount the speaker's platform, almost the entire population of 26,000 is on the scene. The president thanked the Samoans for their loyalty and support. Following the brief address comes the royal Ava ceremony, in which the juice of a bitter, sacred root is sipped by both the high chief of Tutuila and President Johnson. Pouring off the evil spirit part of the potion, Mr. Johnson drinks to fellowship with the royalty of Samoa. The Ta'alolo, or gift-giving ceremony, is next, and precious handmade items are brought forth. Among the exotic presidential gifts is an exquisite handcrafted royal tapa cloth, made from beaten mulberry bark and dyed with root dyes. Native roast pig, the feast dish of the Samoans and other Polynesians, is resplendent on a presentation litter. At the conclusion of the welcoming ceremonies, the Johnsons dedicate a new school as Lady Bird cuts a garland of flowers, officially opening the new educational facility for the children of American Samoa. Touring the new school, which was named the Lady Bird Consolidated School, the Johnsons observed the latest educational television techniques. Teaching by TV has proven highly successful in Samoa. Most teachers are missionaries. Following their visit to the school, President and Mrs. Johnson depart to continue their tour of the Pacific and Asia. Next stop is New Zealand, 1,600 miles to the southwest. By 1630 hours the following day, 19 October, the presidential party is arriving at Wellington Airport aboard a Royal New Zealand Air Force DC-6 after a short hop from their landing point at Ohakea military base. New Zealand's Governor General, Brigadier Sir Bernard Ferguson, greets the Johnsons. Thousands of New Zealanders turn out for the ceremonies. After a short speech of appreciation, President Johnson inspects the honor guard of the Commonwealth. A motorcade carries the presidential party to Government House, where the Johnsons are honored overnight guests of the Governor General. The following day, 20 October, the President is taken on a ceremonial tour of New Zealand's National War Memorial and Parliament House. En route, some citizens of the British Commonwealth nation express displeasure over the Vietnam War. But there are many supporters of President Johnson's policies as well, and his welcome is enthusiastic and warm. Surrounded by members of the Parliament, Mr. Johnson visits that historic building. The whirlwind tour of Wellington continues as President Johnson comes to the Civic Square. Here, the chief executive is greeted by Wellington's mayor, Sir Francis Kitts and Lady Kitts. A host of city dignitaries cram the reception line as thousands of New Zealanders look on. Strolling through the square with Mayor Kitts, the president pauses to admire the beautiful tulip beds. As a military band plays Moon River, the president's visit to New Zealand concludes. The Johnsons board U.S. Air Force One and resume their travels as they head for Australia and the rest of the President's tour of Asia. At one of the largest Army installations in the South, Fort Benning, Georgia, Air Force pilots of the 44-49th Combat Crew Training Squadron are being trained by the Army to fly an Army aircraft, the CV-2 Caribou. This unusual program results from a joint airlift agreement under which the Air Force acquires the Army's entire Caribou fleet, about 130 planes, most of which are located in Southeast Asia. The all-weather Caribou carries about the same load as a C-47 and has a three-man crew, aircraft commander, pilot, and flight mechanic. 
After this group of Air Force pilots complete the four-week course, some will become instructors and remain at Fort Benning to train caribou pilots for the Air Force. A member of an Army Pathfinder unit calls in clearance and a caribou comes in for a low-lex or low-level extraction drop. This technique is similar to LAPES, the Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System used by the Air Force. Moving upstairs, the Air Force pilots check out in heavy equipment drops. By the end of this year, when the Caribous will be officially transferred to the Air Force, the TAC squadron at Fort Benning will have trained enough combat-ready flight crews to man them. At Fort Belvoir, Virginia, a boat powered by water jet instead of conventional propellers is being extensively tested by the Army Mobility Equipment Center's R&D laboratory. Designed to increase mobility in swamps and shallow waters, the fully loaded craft can move at 20 miles an hour over water only nine inches deep. With lighter loads, it can make up to 30 miles an hour. Driven by a gasoline engine, the propulsion unit forces out a powerful jet of water beneath the surface. A special weed cutting mechanism prevents fouling and permits operation in waters clogged with vegetation. Because there are no propellers, men and equipment can be landed on shallow water beaches. To top it off, the aluminum hulled craft weighs only 3,400 pounds light enough for transport by helicopter. <laughs> 